Thank you for the Sunday. We thank you for more Sunday that we can come and hear your word this morning. Lord, fill your hearts with your word. Fill our hearts with your word, Father. Give us concentration this morning. Lord, give us undivided attention this morning to hear your word. Lord, I pray that your presence, your Holy Spirit will teach us as a great teacher this morning. Expound your word to us. Father, reveal your message. I the messenger, Lord, and reveal your message this morning. Have your word, Father. Have your way this morning. I take authority to rebuke every power this morning. In Jesus' name, every authority, every, every obstacle, every hindrance, every distraction this morning. That your word will come forth, Lord. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, turn your Bible to the Gospel of John. Sit down, relax. But be attentive this morning to what the Lord is saying to you and to me. We are coming to an end of the series that we've been doing for a couple of months, I suppose, uh, on the subject of any, any guesses? Yeah. The I am, yes. I am the book. I am from the book of Exodus, chapter 3, 13 to 15. We've been, we've been looking at the nine I am of Jesus in the Gospel of John. I hope this series bless your heart and spoke to you. And suddenly it was a great blessing to me. We started from the book of Exodus, chapter 3. If you have a Bible, you can look at chapter 3, 3, 13 to 15, where Moses was sent by God. We know the story to deliver God's people from the enemies, which were the Egyptians and their system. And Moses received this name, I am, given by God, to declare to God's people that the time has come for their deliverance. In the beginning of our series, we looked at the meaning of I am, which is the Hebrew translation describes as eternal, without beginning or ending. In other words, self-existent or self-existing God who continually dwells with his people. Even before we see the scriptures that he is almighty or all-powerful or all-knowing, God is first, hear me, the I am, a God without beginning or end, existing continuously in the present tense of his people. Can I be that place? Before all these attributes, almighty, powerful and all-knowing, he is first I am, a God without beginning or end, existing continuously in the present tense of his people. I am has always been I am. When we then see God comes in flesh and blood in the New Testament and reveals to us that He is I am. We see that in John chapter 8, 58, this huge discourse that He has with the great London people, the great God, people of God's word, the Pharisees and the scribes, and in that break, in that big discourse, He, he reveals. He tells before Abraham was, I am. That's found in John 8, 58. Jesus calls himself as the I am that Moses declared in the beginning to his people. So we have been meditating the I am of Jesus with great titles given to him. I am the bread of life, John 6, 35, we see. I am the light of the world, John 8, 12, we see. I am the door. John 10, 7 and 9, you see. I am the Good Shepherd. John 10, 11 and 14. I am the Resurrection. John 11 and 25. I am the Life. John 11, 25 and 14, 6. I am the Way. John 14, 6. I am the Truth. John 14, 6. And we come now to I am the True Wine, which is John 15, 1. We come to the last one of John 15. 1 to 8, 
But Jesus says, I am the true vine. Let's read that. Chapter 15, 1 to 8. You got the Bible? Or oh, you just listen to me? John 15, 1 to 8. I am the true vine, and my father is the husband man. I'm reading from King James Version. Every branch in me that bears not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that bears fruit, he purges it that it may bring forth more fruit. Now you are clean through my word, which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abides in the vine, no one can you accept. You abide in me, except you abide in me. I am the vine, verse 5, you are the branches. He that abides in me, and I in him, the same bring forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. If a man abides not in me, he is cast forth as a branch that is without, and men gather them, and cast them into the fire. They are burned. Verse 7, if you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. Verse 8, you are in my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit, so shall you be my disciples. It's a powerful revelation. We continue. We, we can continue to read all of chapter 15. So many things we can learn from the entire chapter 15. But we will stop to focus on the subject that we are doing today. It's I am the true wine. There are so many great truths and information and revelation in this chapter. But I'm not going to go to every detail in the chapter because of time and the discipline of focusing on the topic. So I will look into a few concepts this morning and information which is relevant to our study which can bless us as we apply it in our lives. Now we've got to understand the context here and I always teach that context is important because we don't never ever ever take a scripture or a verse out of context and what you have is your own understanding. <coughs> Never ever take a scripture out of context. All scriptures are interwoven. Scriptures will always interpret scriptures. That's how the Spirit of God has wrote it down. Amen? So what's the context here clearly? We see, before we get into what Jesus is really revealing here, when you actually read the last five chapters, that is from chapter 13 to chapter 17, right? If you read the last five chapters, you will notice that it was written just before Jesus went up to the cross. You got that? Just before he went up to the cross. It was that last night with, with the disciples, before he leaves to complete the great task of dying on the cross. And to deliver mankind from the enemies of sin and death. And here we see he declares this last statement of himself that I am the wine, I am the true wine, to the disciples who gathered with him in that last hour. Do you believe that this, all these five chapters is sort of given in that last round two hours he spent, right after he broke bread, right after he washed the feet of the disciples, right after he said many things to encourage them, and then he comes with this last declaration that I am the true wine. Now I'm going to talk just three essential concepts here. Please hear me. I try to go slow. I'm conscious of me going fast. I want to go slow. I want to talk. I want to talk about three essential concepts that Jesus describes here. Are you doing this morning? The first one is. Any guesses? Why? Second one is branches. The third one is 
husbandman or gardener. Some translation calls him a wine dresser or a gardener. Or as the King James Version calls it, husbandman. This is three essential concepts to understand what it is. Now I always tell you, what I'm sharing in, in 45 minutes or one hour is just the tip of an iceberg. It's just an appetizer. You need to go home and study and meditate the word of God and then apply it into your life. We, it's here from the pulpit is just what God wants you to hear. But there's so much more he wants to talk to you. And no one will be able to, to completely comprehend that from the pulpit. So I just want to lay that very clearly. So we're going to look at the first one. Wine. I said wine branches, husband, man, or gardener. Wine. According to the Miriam Webster's dictionary, wine is a plant whose stem requires support, which climbs by tendrils or twining or creeps along the ground. It sends nutrients from the root to the branches, which then strive and bear fruit. When you look at the grape wine, we all of us have seen in one form of grape wine, there is usually one sturdy stalk, isn't it? Isn't it that? Just one sturdy stalk or a trunk that all the branches are growing from it. Wine doesn't have a branch of little plants that comes from the root. Are you realize that? All branches grow from the main wine, not from the ground. It comes from the main wine. Now, throughout the Old Testament, friends, God repeatedly used wine as a symbol of his people in the Hebrew scriptures. You know that? He always used wine for his people. For instance, we when rehearsing God, how God led the people of Israel out of Egypt and established them in the land of Canaan, the author of Psalms 80, if you look at Psalms 80, the psalmist says, you brought a wine out of Egypt. You can go and see Psalms 8, it's the Psalm 80, 8 to 9. The psalmist says, you brought a wine out of Egypt, you drove out the nations and planted it, and it took deep root and filled the land. Who is talking about here? People of Israel. He's talking about people that God shows. This is Psalms 80. 8 and 9. You brought a wine out of Egypt, he says. You drove out the nations and, and planted it, and it took deep root and filled the lands. But we also see in the Old Testament friends. Along the way, the wine grew wild, off path. It stopped bearing fruit, good fruit. It withered and was consumed by fire. You can read it in Jeremiah 2, 21, Ezekiel 19, 10 and 14, Isaiah 5, 1 to 7. Talk about the negative uh, sort of rendition of wine as God's people. They, went, they became wild, they went off path, they stopped bearing good fruit, they withered and was consumed by fire. So scripture tells you Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Isaiah. Most times wine was used as, a, as an illustration of how the people of God, which is Israel, had strayed from, from the law. And over time, we know wine became a symbol of Israel, right? If you look at any Israel, you find wine, symbol of, his, of Israel. Now in Jesus' day, see what I mean? I'm bringing you back to the New Testament to see clearly. In Jesus' day, vineyards were very much a common feature of the landscape of Israel. As they are still now, in fact. The imagery or the word picture which Jesus drew from his disciples of himself as the wine was therefore very familiar to the disciples. Yeah? Because they can connect. But it was familiar to them for another reason, you know what? Which is why he described himself not only as a wine, but as a true wine, as a real and genuine wine. You see how, how the Lord brings a declaration of himself 
He said, I am the, not just any wine, I am the true wine. Like he spoke a few months ago, I am the good shepherd. Shepherd self is a very highly coming to task. As I said that a couple of months ago. It's not that we think shepherd now. I mean, shepherd is such a highly committed where they give their life for the sheep. But he says, I am the good shepherd. So he brings his level higher than the shepherds. Yeah, again he says, I am the true wine. Genuine, real wine. For in doing so, the Lord was contrasting himself with the nation of Israel, which had been depicted many times in the Old Testament as a wine. The, now the main characteristics of the wine is that it helps the branches, yummy, to be alive, isn't it? And making them capable of, of producing fruit. The strength of the branches is, friends, is defined by the strength of the wine. You know that? The strength of the branches defined as the strength of the wine. As, as much as the strong the wine is, so the branches will be. Jesus declares his disciples that he is a true wine. Jesus is not, not any wine, but a true wine. Meaning the one who can nourish them and keep them bearing fruit is the same with us today, who is a follower of Christ. Jesus is a true wine. So this is all about the wine we're talking about. Second, we're going to, what's the next one? Branches. Verse 5. He says, I am the wine, you are the branches. The branches here refer to the disciples, refer, refers to all the followers that are going to come after all of us sitting over here. So it's the branches. Not just any branch, he says, but the branches that come from him. How do I know that? Verse 2 says, every branch in me. He's talking about the branch that comes from him. You got that this morning. Not just any branch, but the branch that comes from him. Every branch in me. In other words, friends, who we who are his followers as his branches, who comes from what he has brought us into. We, remember the branches don't come from the ground, but it comes from the wine. That's powerful, isn't it? But remember, wine is what gives life to the branches, right? Remember the, from the definition of the wine, that the branches do not grow from the ground, but from the wine. When a branch is cut off from the wine, it loses its ability to produce the fruit. The branches are unable to produce any fruit whatsoever outside of the connection to the vine. Having said that now, it's the branches that produce fruit, not the vine. I heard you this morning. There's so much about that. It's giving you this happy that the Lord is there. The branches is the one that bears fruit, not the vine. But the branches cannot bear fruit if it's not connected to the wine. I hope you're getting this morning. What is it? What you are me and ah. That's the branches. We are the branches. The third one, I'm moving now quickly. Gardener or the husband man. Jesus clearly and simply tells his disciples that God the Father is the gardener, right? The gardener's job is to take away the fruitless branch. You know, it's very important you understand this. The gardener's job is to take away the fruitless branches that are taking up the space for the fruitless, for the fruitful branches to develop. And to prune the fruitful ones so that they can produce more fruit. You got this morning. It's the job of the gardener to take away the fruitless branches, which is taking up much space for the fruitful branches, and also to prune the fruitful branches so they can produce more fruit. If you go to Matthew 21, 30 to 34, 
Jesus gives a brilliant parable there. Matthew 21, 33 to 40, Jesus tells us of an householder planted a vineyard. You go to the story. And he edged around and dug the wine present. Are you reading this morning? 21, Matthew 21 tells us Jesus goes, Jesus tells about a householder planted a vineyard and he edged around, edged it, and dug a wine press in it. Why did he, why did he put a wine press in Because he was so sure that it would bear fruits. Now as we know that Jesus was talking about God the Father as planting a vineyard. He's teaching the people there about God is the husband man, God is the gardener. But I could not, I could not but notice the word edge around. I've seen the word if you go to uh, Matthew 21. It's, Jesus says he edged around. Meaning the Lord protected it, you see. It's, and I was shocked to see the same word. Where else we find this word? Any, any guesses this morning? Aged. They'll know it. Where do you find this word aged again in the whole of the Bible? In Job 1.10. Right back to, the, to the, one of the oldest books in the Bible. Job 1 tells us that Satan tells God that he had made a hedge around Job. It is the exact word hedged. H-E-D-G-E-D. Hedge. Symbolizes protection. It's, it's interesting. Satan tells that God, you have made a hedge about, about when he wanted to do things to Job. He said, I can't do it because you have put a hedge around him. Meaning God has put a form of protection around Job. Job was suddenly a branch in the vineyard of God. I believe because he was so connected to the true wine, Jesus, even though we, he did not see Jesus in the flesh. But how would you explain 1925 of Job? Which says, he says, my Redeemer lives and he, that he shall stand at the left edge of the earth. This is Job. How do you explain that he says, my Redeemer lives? I believe he, he had experience of the true wine. Much before Jesus came in the flesh. You see the edge. Only a, wing, only a gardener will edge. A protection for many things not to not to tamper with the with the branches of the wine. In the same word, Job was hedged by London, even though so much happened. He knew everything was happening and he said, final of his, of, his, of all what he goes through, he says, I know my Redeemer lives. Is that the same statement we friends with you and me? We are living the Redeemer's grace now. We are living in the Redeemer's life that's given to us freely. Do we remember that? So we see the wine, we see the branches, we see the gardener. Clearly mentioned by Jesus here. But what connects all these three concepts, the wine, the branches, and the gardener? What connects them? What brings them together, friends? I was shocked to see what the Lord showed me. There's a key word that brings all this together. Any guesses? And it comes seven times in this verse, in the eight verses. Yeah? What? Abide. The key word that connects these three concepts. It's abide. Seven times Jesus repeats the word. Abide. 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 Why is such a, why is such reputation? Why is such important an emphasis of Christ to mention to, to his disciples, not to the multitude, 5,000 who came after bread, not of 3,000, but to this, to this bunch of 
people who had all the shortcomings and weaknesses and often fell fall short so many times. But he told them about it seven times, friends. Jesus seems to repeat that word about it several times. Why? I believe to drive out a truth that, that can be easily ignored and missed by his disciples. What is Tabai? Can you guess this here this morning? What is Tabai? Seven times Christ intentionally repeated that to his disciples, okay? I think it might be if he had really, uh, told to the crowd who came after him. But he chose the disciples to say it. Abide. Abide is a verb or action word. It, it, is, it isn't a destination. It isn't a place you arrive. But some place that you actively make sure you stay. It's a choice. And it's not forced on. But intentionally decided. Abide is to stay in the place that one has been occupying or to continue to possess a particular quality or, or fulfill a particular role. <coughs> and by the way, it's not my words. It's all from the, from the expository, expository dictionaries that this word they explain to you, what is a Bible. Young please, only the followers of Christ are actually in a capacity to abide. Are you with this moment? Only the followers of Christ are actually in a capacity, in a capacity. Now I'm not saying that it's easy, but in the capacity to abide as much as hard it is. But only they are in the capacity to abide. It's nearly impossible for a shallow Christian or someone who, who goes after Christ only for benefits to abide in Christ. Is that clear this morning? It's nearly impossible for a shallow Christian or someone who goes after Christ only for benefits to abide in Christ. Don't ask me how, that's what the Lord did. That's why I'm convinced, friends, that Christ chooses to give this revelation here in 15.1 that he is a true wine only to those who are serious about it. Are you serious about this morning? Are you serious? Are you really want to go out in this manner no matter what happens? He chooses. Christ has sent us to 5,000 people. Christ has sent us to 3,000 people. Christ has sent us to people who came after him to be healed, to deliver, to, you know, all sort of things. He did it because that's what they came for. Praise God, he did it. But to the great revelation, to this bunch of people, he says, I am the true wise. You are to abide in this. That's powerful. Are you so serious about it? Everything else, I want to say, is the byproduct. Everything else is a how come. He blesses you. And by the way, I was looking at the word blessing. Oh. 170, 112 times the word blessing is mentioned in New Testament. None of it is for material blessing, for, for material prosperity. I was shocked. 112 times the word blessing is mentioned in the Bible. Bless, bless. Not one is for material. So why, why do we don't talk this way? Why is we got a kind of different Christianity not from scriptures today? Don't get me wrong. God can heal you. God can meet all your needs. And he said he will do that. That is his word. All is the outcome of him, of you abiding with him. Everything is possible for God. But one thing is you abiding with him or not. And here you find that he says, abide. So you see what's Hawaii and how the followers actually in the capacity to abide. What does abiding, the next one I'm going to speak is what, and I'll finish in a few minutes, what does abiding in Christ do? You know, that's what we want to know. What does abiding in Christ do? 
first one, abiding in Jesus brings, brings Jesus in us. Oh, okay. Where's that song, Pastor? Verse 4. Abiding in Jesus brings Jesus in us. Abide in me and I in you. A picture of the wine and the branches, isn't it? But the strength of the branches is directly lies in the strength of the wine. In the other words, you are strong as much as you abide in Christ. I put a strength in you. I don't want to mention any other words. You are strong as much as you abide in Christ. Abiding in Christ brings Jesus in you. Do you want that? Or you just want what he gives you? I want him. Because I'm beggar without him. Abiding in Christ brings Jesus in us. He says, abide in me first and I in you. Now this is not a salvation message, right? Salvation is he draws you first. Now don't misunderstand my message this morning. Salvation is what he brings you. You can't come to Christ if he has uncalled you or drawn you. Jesus says, no man can come to me unless my father. What? If you look at the Greek word, it's very strong. It's like a magnet. How many of you know it's magnet? It's like my father draws. You can't come to me unless my father draws you to me. So I'm not talking about salvation. Salvation is the first step. This is walking and following him after you're saved. After you come to Christ. He says, abide in me and I in you. Oh, which God has ever said that? Abide in me, he says, and I in you. Meaning, what's the word means? I abide in you. See how beautiful God is so he comes unto that level, Jesus. He says, Abide in me and I abide in you. You see the depth of Christ. And he says, Abiding in Jesus fasting brings Jesus in us. In other words, another words said, you are strong as much as you abide in Christ. You don't get anything else this morning? Get that. You are strong as much as you abide in Jesus. Second one, abiding in Jesus develops fruit that of its kind. Now, I'm, I'm going to make the clear because I've struggled with this verse for years now and asking, you know, because you see so many things happening and you say, Lord, where is your word? Is the word? He says, no, my word is always the same. Never change. Abiding in Jesus develops fruit that of its kind. Verse 5. I am the wine, you are the branches. He that abides in me and I in him, again he says that. The same brings forth much fruit, for without me, he gives, he gives another, he just rubs it in more. He says, for without me, you can do something. Nothing. What is this? So abiding just develops fruit that, 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 of his, that of his kind. Now what do I want to do about a wine, you know I mean? a wine of a berry plant can only produce berries. Really? Yeah. A wine of a melon can only produce melons. So abiding in Jesus will only produce the nature and character of Jesus. What is that, Pastor? So when you abide in Jesus, you will only produce the nature and the character of the wine. If the wine is a grape wine, you will have the branches producing grapes. So you only produce that what the wine has. And if you are abiding in Jesus, you produce the nature and character of Jesus. What is that? Well, the New Testament gives you a list, which is love, peace, love, joy, peace, long suffering. Gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and self-control. Which the Apostle Paul gives you a list in Galatians 5.22. And we call it the fruit of the Spirit, Holy Spirit. 
the natural character of Jesus is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and self-control. The Lord needs to only share each one. What this means deeper. Self-control is also the fruit of the wine. Take away all the things that we have thought about, what we thought is self-control, I don't have brother because this, this is mine, I'm a very short-tempered, I lose it, yes, all of us do, I do myself. But when you abide with Jesus, the nature and the character is this love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, meekness. Or how did Moses become after 40 years in counting with God? What did Jesus, what did God tell about him? He said, look at my son, he said, Moses, he's the meekest of all people in the earth. So he said, Moses was given the ascendancy by God and he was the meekest person, not before 40 years old. He was raged, he was hot, he was shot, but he killed the Egyptian straight away. He was learned under the art of the Egyptians. He was qualified. He knew every. In fact, he was studying Moses' life 40 years in Egypt. My goodness, you see the level that he was almost an Albert University level in all the skills that he learned in Egypt. Completely top qualified. But God has completely worked with him. And after 40 years, 80 years, God says, Look at my look at my servant Moses. He's a meekest. That means there's nobody meek than him. Nobody is so meek than him. This is Moses. And you see that in the in the church, you see that when he's leading the people into, into promised land. Uh, you wear he cry, you don't know, follow say, I don't want to go, Lord, it's not me, so no, I want to go. Meek is the fruit of being the wife. Men? The proclamation of Jesus that he is the wine, we are the branches, shows that we are insufficient, young friends, in our selves to produce fruit, except by the garden. And we need to admit our insufficiencies to produce fruit in us, and the gardener's all sufficiency to bring out fruit in us, as we abide in the wine. You got that this morning? We cannot be insufficient to produce food ourselves. But the gardener can do. And how does the gardener do this? He does it. He's all sufficient, God. He does it when we abide in the wine. It's an abiding relationship, friends, rather than a working relationship that God expects. You got that this morning? We didn't take that again. It's an abiding relationship rather than a working relationship that God expects. What I mean by that is God will cause us to bear fruit as we abide in Jesus. He has not, he, he never asked us to, to work and work hard and bear fruit. But rather remain and abide in Jesus. And he will produce the fruit through us. Remember the branches, branches are where the fruit grows. And as we do, but you understand that. It's important. Our abiding relationship today. What God expects and always is abiding relationship. But often we get in the temptation of working relationship. We want to do something. All of us good, but you cannot do by yourself. That's how the Lord has designed it. Abiding relationship is what He expects, not a working relationship. God will cause us to bear fruit as we abide in Jesus. He has not asked us to go work hard to bear fruit, but rather remain. And many men are going to tell you when they, when they started coming to a place of closing to God, close in that closet with God, when they start being still, there when they got visions and birth of experience to God. Not the other way around. And when they were broken to a level that God seen, and that's when he used them. Amen. Remember the branches are where the fruit grows. Is Jesus, I'm going to finish in three minutes now. Is Jesus a true wine? Well, we may answer yes. And that's lovely. That's wonderful. 
that Jesus is our true wine. That's spectacular, I love that. But are we his branches? If yes, which is still beautiful, wonderful that we, we believe we know that we are his branches. But then are we staying, staying connected with him? By abiding even when we are pruned by the gardener? Oh, that's the nudge, isn't it? Oh, we are biting him even when he prunes us? Does he prune us? Yes. Are we his branches? Yes. But do we stay connected with him by abiding even when we are pruned by the gardener? Pruned branches, hear me now, take another point here. Pruned branches do not wither. You know that? And move Pruned branches do not wither off or get dry. Only branches that are failed to abide in the vine. Jesus says a clear meaning. If, if a man abides not in verse 6 in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire for their burn. Pruned branches do not wither or get dry. Even though you see all the enemy will have to show to you and say that you are no more, you are gone. That's, that's it about you. I get it all the time. But if you're connected, if you abide, pruned branches don't be that. I don't know, but God spoke to me so strongly. I'm just right like now talking to you about it. Pruned branches don't wither off or get dry. Only branches that fail to abide in the vine. Are you a pruned branch or you are not abiding branch in the vine? Are you a pruned branch or you are not abiding? Branch in the wine. That's the place it's supposed to be. A non abiding branch in the wine. What will happen? Sooner or later, withering takes place. Sooner or later, dryness will come in because there's no source coming from the wine. And just a matter of time, you're gathered up for another purpose. Are you a prune branch? See, true Christian living friends is abiding relationship with Jesus, not a working relationship. He does the work in us as we do the abiding in Him. You got that this morning? Whatever you, you can't get this morning, get this one. True Christian living is an abiding relationship with Jesus, not a working relationship. He does the work in us as we do the abiding in Him. And because here only comes all the problems we see today. Here comes all the denominations we see in the world today, in Christian. Here comes everything else here. Because we, somehow we think that we can do what God can, what God can do. Somehow that, that nature comes in us, the fallen nature, it just comes to us now and then and says, you know what Lord, I want to do this way for you. No, Lord, I think this is how we should do it. We go back no Lord. But listen to me. Listen to me. We don't tell them directly, but we do. In our behavior. Lord, listen to me. I know this. I got this book out. So now you don't. I know, I know, because I've read a couple of books. It inspired me. I've read a, a, a couple of motivation books. It showed me some strategies. So now you don't. You may work for that person. But those strategies would have come from a Brokenness, you don't know anything about. You take your strategies and says, let's, let's do it. He says, no, you are actually, you are actually going into the non-abiding branch. Beware. It's gone. I am a true wine, and my father is the husband man. Every branch of me that bears not fruit, he takes away. Every branch that bears fruit, he purges it, that you, that it may bring more fruit. Good thank you, Father. Lord, we thank you for this nine irons that you've spoken to us. Father, we thank you as we come to close of the series for the past two or three months we have been here in church. Thank you, Father, for blessing us and, and how amazingly you kept the best to reveal to your followers what is to abide in the true ones. 
Thank you for telling us that you are the bread of life. Thank you for telling us that you are the light of the world. Thank you for telling us that you are the door. You are the good shepherd. You are the resurrection. We, we do not fear death and suffering and illness. Even if you have to die, we do not fear that because you are the resurrection. You are the life. Doesn't matter what, what standard and definition the world gives us about our life. You are our life. You are our way. You are the truth. And you are the true wine that calls us to abide in you. Thank you, Father. Lord, as I lay my hands this morning to the congregation, everyone speak over your everyone, Father, young in the hold, children. Lord, I place my hand this morning on top of them. More important that your hand is upon them, that they'll understand to apply. I pray for the coming week. And they go back and listen to the YouTube and even the online viewers who's, who's listening to this message on YouTube. Lord, that you will speak to them. More importantly, that you will give them the strength to abide. Even that strength not come from us. The wine gives the branch strength. Father, we pray this morning. Bless the congregation this morning. Let them take this word and live out every day of their life. Even if they fall ten times, they will sleep. They will not get up, Lord, because you are the true wine. We thank you, Father. We thank you, Lord. We thank you. Bless the this morning, Father. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless.